good afternoon everybody uh, so the second part of the short history of nuclear astrophysics is about the origin of the elements the history of the origin of the elements how we learned about the origin of the elements in the 20th century uh, oops for some reason ah yeah okay i can move i had some problem so as we said in the first part, nuclear astrophysics emerged in the early 20th century and there were two main objectives for this marriage of astrophysics and nuclear physics. The first objective, the origin of stellar energy we have seen last time. And the second part is the origin of the chemical elements in the universe. And we shall see there were many ramifications of this enterprise during the whole 20th century. Hundreds of people uh, working on those topics uh, that emerged uh, from the merging of nuclear physics and astrophysics. Now, we all know the periodic table of the elements developed by Dmitry Mendeleev in the 19th century. He was smart enough to leave some holes there in the table for new elements to be added. And indeed, they were discovered in the proper places. And this is a modern form of this uh, periodic table of the elements, which are as we all know, classified there in terms of their electronic properties, the atomic, the properties of the corresponding atoms. Already in the early 20th century, there was <coughs> uh, people who were measuring the abundances of those elements first in the Earth's crust. It was very important for uh, the development of the Industrial Revolution in those days. And uh, you see the abundances of uh, a modern representation of the abundances of the elements, the composition of the Earth's crust. And already in that time, uh, William Harkins, an American chemist, had uh, uh, formulated the idea, had noticed that element, there are some elements that are more abundant than others. And uh, in this particular case, uh, even elements are more abundant than old ones. And uh, he suggested that this should be attributed not to the way they are classified in the periodic table. This has nothing to do with their position in the periodic table, but rather to the structure of the underlying nuclei. Now, what about this was about the Earth's crust. Now, what about the composition of uh, the stars? galaxies and other objects in the universe. As we said last time, stellar spectroscopy is able to reveal the presence of chemical elements in stellar surfaces, but the determination of abundances requires models of stellar atmospheres. It's not a di direct enterprise. And this became really possible in 1925 with Cecilia Payne noticed during her thesis that hydrogen and helium are the most abundant elements in the sun and in st st uh, stars like the sun. And we have seen the story of uh, Cecilia Payne and the difficulties she had to make people accept this idea of uh, predominance of hydrogen and helium. It was rejected by the most prominent American astronomer of that time, Henry Norris Russell. But Russell, who was not an idiot, a couple of years later realized that uh, he was wrong and uh, he understood that Cecilia Payne was right. And uh, he made an extensive investigation of the composition of the atmosphere of the sun. And he published the first uh, table of the abundances of elements in the sun. A very lengthy article appeared in 1929 in the Astrophysical Journal, which is the equivalent of the modern uh, uh, compilations we are using now from Asplund or Asplund or from Loders and so on. Uh, and in that, he noticed also what uh, Harkins uh, has seen, first of all, that hydrogen is, of course, the most abundant element, but also that there are uh, this uh, uh, property of the composition of the Earth's crust, namely the predominance of even overall elements, is also encountered in the composition of the Sun. After that, once you have some data, and in that case, we have data about the composition of the, star and the stars and the sun. People are trying to explain that composition, to understand them in terms of physical processes. And the first one who tried to understand the composition of stars uh, in the universe was the guy that, uh, with Hutterman's, 
had proposed also that the tunnel effect would explain how protons are fusing in the sun, namely Robert Atkinson. We have seen that uh, name last time. And in 1931, he proposed a very ambitious synthesis theory of stellar energy and the origin of the elements, where he tried to build the various elements step by step from lighter ones in stellar interiors. But he was, it was too early because neutrons were unknown in 1931. As we all know, the neutron was discovered in 1932. And it was impossible to make a theory of nucleosynthesis. Still, the guy tried a lot, but from the first step, he stumbled across the problem of helium. How do you make helium four from four protons? He had to recognize because <clears throat> Neutrons, as I said, were unknown by then. So the only possibility to assume that the helium atom was four protons plus two electrons and such a reaction, putting together six uh, particles, was impossible. So he had to assume that helium was coming from another process, perhaps by radioactivity, which was known at that time, alpha radioactivity. And then once you have helium, then by capturing protons and electrons successively, you can try to build the other elements. Independently of the process, what is really uh, completely imaginary, what is important in that paper is that he noticed that hydrogen is the most abundant element. You see that he attributes that to Russell. Russell has recently shown, in fact, it was not Russell, it was Cecilia, Cecilia Payne. But when you have a young and unknown scientist and a very famous one, it's always the very famous who is uh, put forward. And people acknowledge, uh, know, know his name and put it that. So Russell is acknowledged for that discovery. So Atkinson says that since in addition, the hydrogen nucleus is probably much simpler than any other, it seems very reasonable to assume that in its initial state, any star or indeed the entire universe was composed solely of hydrogen. This is the first time that we see clearly that statement that at the base of everything was hydrogen. Apart from that, and the part of the attempt to put nucleosynthesis in star, inside stars, the paper of Atkinson was totally wrong. Still, he claimed that he could reproduce the observations of Russell through his scheme. The relative proportions of the elements follow in good agreement for in excellent qualitative agreement with Russell's figures for the sun. And for that, he was based in Gamow's theory of nuclear stability and to the peculiarities of the Aston mass defect curve. He knew the properties of nuclei through the Aston uh, formula and um, he thought that he could reproduce he somehow he cooked his recipes you can try to read his paper it is you can find it in astrophysical journal and understand what he did and from what i understood basically he he cooked uh, everything to look like uh, the data of uh, russell so he was fairly satisfied with his theory but uh, of course he produced uh, nothing really correct. Neutron was discovered the next year, 1932. And uh, at that time, there is an interesting paper by Carl von Feidsecker. At the age of 25, this guy formulated the, made a very thorough, very penetrative analysis of what we knew about the composition of stars and how we could do them. He recognized that nuclear reactions certainly take place in stellar interiors, and one could try, like Atkinson did, to take the same reactions to produce uh, the composition of the stars. But on the other hand, he recognized that it's not, this is not necessarily the case. And we cannot exclude at the outset the possibility that the chemical elements were formed by another process prior to the formation of the stars as we know them. What kind of process, it was not clear. Just a few things about von Weizsäcker. It's uh, funny sometimes how things happen. Uh, 
His father, Ernest von Weizsäcker, was a diplomat and a politician. He was a minister, vice minister of uh, external affairs in the Nazi regime. And he was near in try. <coughs> Uh, he was considered as a war criminal in the Nuremberg II trial, where he was defended by his younger son, Richard von Weizsäcker, who was a politician, became president. He was a lawyer, in fact. He defended his father in the trial. And later he became president of the German Republic, both before and after the unification of Germany in '89. And finally, the elder son, Karl von Weizsäcker, who was a uh, really the prodigy of the family. He was uh, a student of uh, Heisenberg and he participated also, he was among the few German scientists who participated in the nuclear weapons program of the Third Reich. And after the war, he and many, several other scientists were uh, captured by the Allies and they were uh, transported to the farm hall near London and they, their conversations were monitored without them knowing that. And they were uh, released, what they said was released uh, were many years after the wars, the classified. And uh, apparently when the first atom bomb exploded in Hiroshima, when they learned that, Weizsäcker said that uh, uh, of course, German scientists were discussing why they had not made the atom bomb themselves. And Weizsäcker said, at least this is in the transcripts of their conversation, I believe the reason we didn't do it was because all the physicists, uh, if they had wanted Germany to win the war, we would have succeeded. Uh, Heisenberg said that this is not quite right. We could perhaps... Uh, do that, but I never thought we would make a bomb. I'm glad we did not make it. So from those conversations, it appears as the German scientists were not very eager to make the bomb. But uh, one of them, Max von Laue, called that, said that this was uh, an agreement they had made, Weizsäcker made with Heisenberg and others to say such things. Because, uh, as von Laue says, I did not hear any mention of any ethical point of view into that. So it's not because they did not want it to do it, because, because they couldn't do it. This is a fascina fascinating topic for historians of science. It's not clear yet why the Germans, although they had an excellent science, could not manage to make the bomb. But von Weizsäcker was deeply involved in those things. Anyway, a few years later, we have, as we have seen last time, the famous paper by, for energy production in stars through the CNO cycle by Hans Bethe. And Bethe stated clearly that uh, no elements can be built behind, <clears throat> beyond helium-4 in ordinary stars. This is very important, not in any kind of star, but in ordinary stars. And he identified the problem why it can be. It is because of the instability of uh, beryllium-8, uh, the fact that proton bombardment uh, can destroy all the heavier nuclei. And so, his conclusion, uh, the fact also that there are new neutrons in stars of the main sequence. And uh, his conclusion was that the heavier elements found in stars must therefore have existed already when the star was formed. A very strong and correct conclusion. So let us summarize now what we have seen up to 1940, the state of uh, things. Harkins, with uh, uh, even elements uh, being more abundant than old ones in, in the crust of the Earth. Cecilia Payne, with stars made mostly of hydrogen. Russell, with stellar abundances displaying such regularities similar to those on Earth. Atkinson, trying the first attempt to build up the elements in stellar interiors by hydrogen. But of course, he could not even make helium. And uh, von Weizsäcker suggesting that perhaps something, uh, the elements were made elsewhere and not inside the stars that we see them. And Bethe stating clearly that normal stars cannot make elements heavier than helium in their interiors. Now, 
uh, let us, uh, I'm, I think that we all have this representation in mind, the solar, the cosmic abundances of the elements with all these ups and downs. The odd even effect is uh, clearly seen there, but also other things are seen there. It's not a flat curve, it's uh, a descending curve with a peak around iron. And uh, one may be tempted to compare this. You see the same curve in the top panel there and in the uh, lower panel you have the binding energy per nucleon which is a measure of the stability of the nuclei and we all know that there are correspondences between the two curves but not in a global level globally you see the iron is the major element and the major isotope in the lower curve the most stable nucleus in the upper curve it dominates but not globally locally and again, the other things, the stable nuclei in the lower panel, they are also dominate, but only locally, not globally. And the most abundant nuclei, hydrogen and helium, are not the most stable ones, far from that, as you see in the lower panel. So, the important thing from this comparison is that cosmic abundances of nucleides are locally correlated with nuclear stability. The alpha nuclei, uh, the iron peak nuclei, the, old, the even nuclei are all dominant, but again, for some portion of the diagram. This immediately tells us something that nuclei have been, over all the periodic table, have been produced first of all, by nuclear reactions, because there is correspondence, because there are nuclear, nuclear properties and their abundances. But since this correspondence is not global, this means that there have been several, not one, a unique process, but several processes, which contributing to shaping different parts of that curve. And this is what makes nucleosynthesis a rather complicated thing. Because as we shall see, all those elements were cooked in various places, in various times, in sites with difficult, different physical conditions and different lifetimes. And they went through the cosmic blender to make what we observe in the sun. Okay, so just a reminder about uh, nuclear reactions. I'm sure you know all of that, but uh, since I make this uh, thing both for astronomers who know not necessarily about nuclear astrophysics. So nuclear reactions, we have uh, systems where the rate of nuclear reactions is much larger than the characteristic time scale of the system, both for direct and inverse reactions. In that case, we have what we call nuclear statistical equilibrium, where the abundances of nuclei depend on the physical conditions and the binding energies of the nuclei. And then if the opposite happens, if the rates are shorter than the characteristic time scales, then the reactions, or at least some of them, proceed slowly, and the abundances of the nuclei depend on the individual reaction rates and uh, they are coupled to the abundances of the other nuclei so you need to have a system of coupled equations differential equations with a time dependent treatment which is more cumbersome to solve and uh, also you need to know the rates of the reactions so traditionally for facility for uh, reasons for commodity reasons uh, equilibrium nuclear statistical equilibrium was considered to calculate the abundances of the elements. And the first to do that was Subramanian Chandrasekhar, the guy who had uh, 10 years before uh, formulated the ideas about the maximum mass of a white dwarf and for which he got the Nobel Prize in uh, physics in 1983. One of the most uh, prolific and uh, greatest uh, astrophysicists of the 20th century. In a paper with Louis Henrich in uh, 1942, he considered that, <laughs> you see that it is now generally agreed that the chemical elements cannot be synthesized under conditions now believed to exist in stellar interiors. On the other hand, the regularities require some explanation. And therefore, he considered that the elements were formed at an earlier pre-stellar stage of the universe. You see how the idea of Bete 
Bete, however, was very, very cautious. He said that elements cannot be made in normal stars, not in any kind of star. And you see that Sandra Sekar generalized that and say not in stellar interiors, any kind of stellar interior. And so he went to explore what would happen in an early stage of the universe, in a hot stage where von Weizsäcker had also considered that. And he tried to calculate that in uh, chemical equilibrium, in nuclear statistical equilibrium. And uh, he started in very high densities and temperatures, extremely high ones. And uh, he found that uh, he could produce some heavy elements, but not others, and of course, not iron or heavier nuclei. It was the first attempt, uh, totally failed to make things in and it was in a static environment, not an evolving, evolving environment. Evolving, I mean, by for conditions of temperature and density. A few years later, Fred Hoyle in England considered a different process. He came back to the idea of uh, Atkinson, but now neutrons were discovered. The situation was different. He did not try to make the elements in normal stars. He knew about that, he, he had read what Bete has written, but he knew also that when the, chem the fuel of a star uh, is exhausted, then the star, the core of the star should condense and its temperature and uh, density would rise. And if the star would become very hot, then the temperature at the center of collapsing star would rise and is shown that value sufficiently high for statistical equilibrium between the elements must so the relative abundance of them can then be worked out from the equations of statistical mechanics it's again the same thing as i said before because it's easier to evaluate that uh, abundances of isot nuclei or whatever in conditions of equilibrium and that's what he uh, hoyle tried to do and he found that you can make a lot of iron and iron peak elements in some cases. But his problem was a little bit different. Even if you assume that you manage to make the elements in the condensing star, how do you take them out of the star to spread them in the universe? In those days, of course, now we know the answer, supernova. But in those days, it was not very clear what supernova were exactly. And so Hoyle preferred to say that, to imagine that rotation and instability enables the star to throw the material off to infinity. And this was his way to take elements outside stars. Now, in those days, the theory of the expanding universe due to observations of Hubble was very, was starting to become popular although by no way uh, definitely established. And uh, George Gamow, that we have seen also last time, uh, proposing the tunnel effect for the alpha radioactivity, tried also, had imagined that he could uh, make the elements in the early universe. But in contrast to Sandra Sekar, who just considered a static universe at uh, conditions of uh, uh, stable temperature, he knew that the equations of uh, Lemaitre suggested that the early universe evolved fairly rapidly. Temperature and density were going down very, very rapidly. And he was worried about the fact that, uh, first of all, he noticed that we should not speak about equilibrium. Uh, but also, he noticed that uh, there were fr free neutrons in the early universe and their beta decay time could be very short. And so if you want to make nucleosynthesis by neutron capture, you need um, to take uh, to consider that such nuclear reactions should take place in a fairly short time before the neutrons have time to decay completely. Because if you have only protons, then it will be very hard to overcome the, the Coulomb barriers because the temperature went down very rapidly. And so he was the first to suggest that uh, time-dependent nucleosynthesis should be considered. It was the first suggestion of such a, a thing. And he put this 
he realized that in a couple of years later, along with his student Alfer and uh, not really Hans Bethe. You see there on the right, Alfer on the right, uh, uh, it was his first paper, uh, in fact. Uh, Gamov in the middle coming out of the bottle, from the bottle which uh, has a name Ilem, was this name that a Hebrew word for primeval matter. And the guy on the left is uh, another student of Ham Gamov, uh, Hermann. So on the paper, you see also Hans Bethe, but uh, Bethe did nothing for that paper. Gamov put his name there because he wanted uh, that the names of the authors correspond to the first three letters of the Greek alphabet, Alpha, Beta, Gamma. And on top of that, the paper was published on April 1st, uh, 1948. It was a coincidence. Uh, Gamov was not responsible for that. It was a fairly short paper, one page, one equation, one figure. And in that, Gamow suggested that the observed slope of the abundance curve must not be related to the temperature of the original neutron gas. He imagined only neutrons, nothing else, but rather to the time period permitted by the expansion process. As time went on, you had less and less reactions with neutrons. That was his point. Also, the individual abundances of various nuclear species must depend not so much on their stability, the mass defect, which is the case at equilibrium, but not here, but on the values of their neutron capture cross-sections. This was a problem because you need the cross-sections to make calculations in that case. And uh, But hopefully, uh, luckily enough, in those days, the data from the first uh, nuclear test uh, of the Americans in Alamogordo, New Mexico, had been re released, declassified in the conference of the American Physical Society in 46 and published. So they used this data, but those data concerned nuclei above neon 20, not below. And below, they had to extrapolate to evaluate the neutron capture cross sections. I don't know if some of you recognize the equation, the only equation of the paper which they used which involves the abundances of the nuclei and the cro neutron capture cross-sections, the sigma. Now, this has nothing to do, we know now, with primordial nucleosynthesis. It corresponds more to the what we call the classical S process, where in AGB stars, you form elements heavier, half of the isotopes heavier than iron, by neutron captures on long time scales. And uh, this is the equation they used. And this is what they found. You see the solid curve there compared to the data, which is the histogram. And uh, is it a good fit or a bad fit? It depends uh, on what you have in mind. Uh, you could say that it's a good fit to a zeroth order, but actually it was a very bad fit, although the abundances cover almost 10 orders of magnitude on the logarithmic vertical scale. Because all those features that we have seen in this curve, in the observed abundance curve, have their own significance. All those uh, O even uh, effect, the iron peak, the fact that the elements uh, between helium and carbon and so underabundant and so on, all these things have their own significance and point out to a much, much more complex thing than just a unique event. Anyway, Gamow was very successful in selling his ideas. He was a great popularizer of science also. And uh, he convinced uh, uh, people that uh, what they found was very important. So when Alfer defended his thesis a few weeks later, a couple of weeks later, the lecture room was full of people, more than 300 people. Half of them were journalists. And so the next... Uh, Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, I had uh, forgotten that point. Okay, so it's not very important. So next day, the Washington Post on 16 of April, 48, appeared with a paper for that uh, event saying that uh, the world began in five minutes, new theory. The neutrons, the particles that uh, trigger the atomic bomb, starting decaying into protons and building up the heavier chemical elements. So the idea was, um, in fact, I <coughs> did not mention that, that some neutrons were decaying. Of course, the neutron decay is a stochastic process. So some of them decayed into protons and then forming deuterium, and the subsequent protons were captured on deuterium, go uh, 
up uh, periodic table. Now, of course, all of that was completely wrong, as Fermi, uh, Enrico Fermi and his student uh, suggested a few years later. Uh, the gap for, due to all mass numbers 5 and 8 is such that no elements beyond helium can be produced. In fact, the gap of at A equal 5 can be bridged by uh, reactions of helium either with helium 3 or tritium 3. Tritium three. And then you go to lithium seven. But the next gap at mass number equal eight is impossible to be bridged. And uh, we have to wait uh, for uh, hundreds of millions of years later when uh, stars are formed and in their course, temperatures become very high and densities for a long time to allow for the triple alpha reaction. This is how the second barrier is uh, bridged. And Hayashi in 1950 pointed out that at 10 billion degrees, neutron proton equilibrium should take place. And so the equations of primordial nucleosynthesis are not those that Gamow have used, uh, which correspond, as we said, to the classical S process, nothing to do with primordial nucleosynthesis. And the first the true calculations of primordial nucleosynthesis we are made after the discovery of the three micro three Kelvin microwave background by Jim Peebles and by Wagner, Fowler and Hoyle. And this is also what uh, Alain Koch and colleagues made uh, much, much, uh, much later and very recently, the most recent calculations uh, and updated, of course, of uh, this uh, important process, which uh, makes essentially nuclei up to lithium seven, part of lithium seven that we see around us today. But the event was quite important because uh, in those days, the Pope thought that he could use that to uh, defend the positions of the church. And in famous address to the Pontifical Academy of Science in September 51, he said that uh, the primordial fiat lux uh, is uh, proved now by science, which tells us that Millions of centuries ago, along with matter, there burst from nothing a sea of matter and radiation, while the particles of chemical, chemical elements split and made millions of galaxies. Hence, creation took place in time, therefore there is a creator, therefore God exists. Gamow was uh, not happy with that, but even less happy with Georges Lemaitre, who he was not only a first-rank scientist, but also a uh, Catholic priest, and he wrote to the Pope, and uh, he met with him in Vatican and uh, apparently convinced him that uh, he should not insist a lot on that because uh, science should not be mixed up with religion. They are very different things. Uh, science cannot speak about of creation, but is uh, only studying uh, transformations of matter. It cannot speak about creation of matter from nothing. Uh, when I first uh, learned about this history many years ago, I thought that this was the main motivation of Lemaitre. But in fact, I read later from uh, other historians of science that uh, what Lemaitre wanted to avoid was uh, his theory to be badly considered by his colleagues. Because in those days, there was a fierce competition between the steady state theory, steady state theory of Fred Hoyle, uh, Bondi and Gold, and the primeval fireball that Gamow defended. And if the Pope interfered in that uh, <laughs> by saying that, okay, science tells us that uh, this is what happened, it would appear to scientists that the Pope takes position for one of two competing theories, and this would uh, perhaps discredit the other theory altogether. And this was the main motivation of Lemaitre. Whatever it is, uh, the Pope understood and never came back to that. The Catholic Church never used this uh, thing anymore in the 50s, at least officially. So we had in the late 40s two theories about the origin of the elements, uh, one for the Big, the big Bang, the hot uh, fireball, as Gamow called it. He never used the term Big Bang, which was coined by Hoyle. Uh, ironically, in one of his uh, BBC broadcasts uh, uh, that he made in the 50s. Uh, 
and Hoyle had his own theory of all elements, including helium, were produced inside stars during their collapsing stage by thermonuclear reactions. And this usually happens when you have two competing theories in astronomy, it's observations that uh, decide. And in the early 50s, it appeared that the old stars of the galactic halo, that we call uh, population two stars, contain much less heavy elements than the younger stellar populations, which are in the disk of the galaxy. And so it was uh, improbable that Gamow uh, was right, because uh, if he was right, if all the elements were made in the Big Bang, then all stars formed subsequently should have the same composition. And uh, the theory of Hoyle was uh, uh, imposed. Still, it was not clear, even if it was now the people agreed that elements are made in stars, it was not clear how they could be made in stars proton-proton chains and can produce helium, of course. But what do you do with the helium and how do you go to the next elements? The three less, uh, subsequent elements, lithium, beryllium and boron, were fairly fragile. They could not stand temperatures in stellar interiors. They are destroyed each time they are submitted to temperatures of the order of a few million degrees. So how do you go from helium to heavier nuclei, how to overcome the A equal 8 barrier, because you can capture two helium nuclei. So this was half of that problem was solved by Edwin Salpeter. He was uh, uh, born in Austria and uh, being Jewish, uh, he uh, immigrated to Australia with his parents in the 30s and worked there. And later he went to the United States uh, as he... Uh... So Salpeter uh, found that uh, temperatures of about 200 million degrees, they could have the triple alpha reaction. So how do you go over the A equal 8 barrier by capturing two helium, by the encounter of two helium nuclei who form a very unstable beryllium nucleus? Usually the beryllium nucleus is uh, split again to two alpha particles in a split second, 10 to the minus 9, 17 seconds. But if you are in a medium of uh, sufficiently high density, since uh, the reaction is uh, between three bodies and the rate of the reaction increases with the square of the density, if you have a medium in those conditions for a sufficiently long time, then some of the beryllium nuclei can capture before their disintegration a third alpha particle. And uh, Salpeter showed that uh, the rate of the first reaction, the two alphas to beryllium, uh, was uh, sufficiently uh, rapid to allow this reaction to happen in reasonable time within red giants, in the course of which the temperature was high enough. But what happens to the next step, the capture of uh, the helium-4 nucleus? Uh, it's to, on the beryllium-8 nucleus. Its reaction rate did not seem to be sufficient for that process. And uh, so here we have the fairly well-known, uh, I think there is no nuclear astrophysicist who doesn't know that, the fact that Okay, this is for uh, some other um, audience. You know everything about resonant reactions. So what happened was that uh, Fred Hoyle came and suggested that in order for the reaction beryllium-8 plus alpha to be sufficiently rapid to occur in red giant cores at temperatures of a few hundreds of millions of degrees, the carbon-12 nucleus should have a level at a particular a particular level which would make this reaction resonant. And you see there uh, with those double arrows in the middle where they should, uh, the ranges of temperature where this uh, resonance should lie. And not only that, but the next reaction, because the carbon 12 nucleus could also capture an alpha particle to become oxygen 16. And in that case, there should not be enough carbon-12 in the universe. All of the, we should go directly from the alpha particle to oxygen-16. But 
he also suggested that there should be no such level in the corresponding place in the oxygen-16 nucleus. And by some, not some miracle, but uh, his colleagues in uh, the Kellogg laboratory in the United States that he visited in the 50s, were able to show that such a level indeed exists. And this amazed a lot of people. Uh, and in particular, William Fowler, the head of the laboratory, who was a nuclear physicist. And uh, he basically shifted into nuclear astrophysics ever since then, working with Hoyle most of the time and contributed enormously to the development of nuclear astrophysics. It was the first quantitative prediction of a microscopic property of matter, the structure of uh, a nucleus, based on a macroscopic one, the fact that carbon-12 is abundant in nature and also oxygen-16. Based on that, Hoyle concluded that there should be this particular state. For some people, this is the first and only prediction of the anthropic principle. But this is another matter of discussion. So the first, uh, the, the big problem now, how to go from the, heavy, the lightest uh, of this nucleosynthesized elements, helium, which was known to be synthesized in stars, because this is the reaction that powers the stars. But how to go from helium to other nuclei uh, was difficult to understand. Now, this problem was solved in 1953. And now Hoyle could uh, take a step further and in a famously unknown paper in 1954, he went through all the nuclei up to the iron peak, showing how they can make by what kind of nuclear reactions. This paper is not well known. It was overshadowed by the next paper we shall see. But uh, the next paper had uh, uh, mostly some other. Uh, he synthesized, of course, all the previous work. But the work for the elements up to nickel was already done by Hoyle in 54. And in that paper of Hoyle in 54, you will also see for the first time appearing the scheme of what we now call galactic chemical evolution. The fact that we start with intergalactic material, essentially hydrogen for Hoyle, making galaxies. Inside galaxies, there is gas, ordinary stars, collapsing stars that make uh, elements because their temperature increases exploding stars which eject their material to the gas and then the cycle starts again he called that the general cosmological framework assumed for this discussion because remember hoyle never admitted the theory of the big bang he was always in the framework of the steady state universe so there was not an initial uh, state with uh, hydrogen and helium. No, there was initially only protons in the intergalactic material. Because according to the steady state theory, the expansion of galaxies created voids in which matter in the form of protons and electrons appeared from the void, from the vacuum. Uh, but this is the first time you see a diagram related to what we call galactic chemical evolution. Now, uh, yes, okay, so in uh, 54, Hoyle proposes the processes that go up to iron, uh, to the iron peak, up to nickel, and then there remain a lot of elements above iron, either close to the valley of nuclear stability or a little bit further away. Uh, and all these things were now put in a very um, an appropriate framework in risk with observations of stars by those four people, the Barbages and William Fowler and Fred Hoyle, in the famous paper which appeared in Reviews of Modern Physics in 57, and where you see two citations from uh, William Shakespeare. Now, what they did is essentially plotted in this extremely complicated diagram, which is never used even in textbooks today. And it is never used because it's so complicated. But it summarizes 
in one figure all the processes of nucleosynthesis. These lines, horizontal lines, are mainly hydrogen burning, which include the CNO cycle, the neon sodium cycle, also that uh, Fowler had just discovered with Marion in 1957, helium nuclei, helium burning, carbon, making the alpha elements, carbon 12, oxygen 16, neon 20, but also uh, other nuclei. Uh, producing neutrons from alpha N reactions, these green arrows there, and then the so called, what they call the alpha process, going from uh, sulfur to titanium 48, the nuclear equilibrium process, going from uh, all those uh, heavy nuclei on the left to the iron group, and then the neutrons that were produced from alpha N reactions were uh, captured on uh, iron peak nuclei for the slow capture, the S process, and also from other reactions on the rapid capture, the R process. You see there appearing for the S process, technetium-99. Technetium-99 is an stable isotope and it was discovered in 1953 by Merrill in the surfaces of a NAGB star. And since it is unstable with a lifetime of one million years, much shorter than the lifetime of the AGB star, it was clear that technetium-99 was produced inside the AGB star itself. It was the first signature, that uh, clear sig observational signature that elements are produced inside stars. Now, for the rapid capture, you see Californium-254. Perhaps you never heard about this isotope, but you see his name associated with the R process there. We shall see in a moment why. And also the transbismuth elements, uranium, thorium, etc. And they made use for to calculate those processes also of the data of the neutron capture cross-sections from the first uh, um, thermonuclear bomb in uh, Bikini Island in 54. At the same time appeared another paper signed by Alastair Cameron, who independently and of the others had also made similar conclusions about the production of elements in stars and he had made this classification. He noticed that as well as uh, the, bar the B square FH paper, that those fragile elements cannot be formed in stellar interiors, perhaps by nuclear reactions in stellar atmospheres. The other elements were about what kind of processes, the iron peak by statistical equilibrium. This was what Hoyle had already suggested in 1946. And then for the heavier than iron elements, uh, ele <clears throat> either on short lifetime scale, short time scales or on long time scales. This is the R and S process and some other elements, proton captures and so on. So already we had a rather clear exposition of which processes take place in which elements, but there were ex exceptions. The fragile elements were under uh, question. Helium appeared by, and it was Fred Hoyle who discovered that, that it was not so easy to make. Helium is extremely abundant. One quarter of the matter in the universe in the form, uh, composition of stars in the form of helium. Nucleosynthesis cannot make so much. And Hoyle noticed in a paper with his student Tyler in Nature in 64, that if all the helium in the universe was made by stars, by proton, proton reactions, which produce the energy of stars, then there should be a lot of light around. Stars should produce much more light, which be seen around us in the form of a diffuse background. And he calculated that uh, since we do not see such a diffuse background, helium cannot be made by stars. So another process is required. And since Hoyle was for the steady state theory, he said that this process is the explosions of supermassive stars, very rare objects. But uh, this was clearly uh, so I I had some trouble here. <clears throat> 
Uh, excuse me, just just one second. Um, okay, sorry. So in 65, there was a discovery of the cosmic microwave background by Penzias and Wilson. And here I show the speech of Arno Penzias when he took his Nobel Prize in 58. He used a lot this uh, thing, namely the fact that stars cannot make helium, saying that most of this, the oxygen we breathe, the iron on our blood, the uranium in our reactors is formed during the lifetimes of stars. A few elements, however, were formed before the stars ever existed, during the birth of the universe itself. And he had in mind, of course, helium, which Hoyle has acknowledged that he cannot be made in stars. Uh, so, as I said before, the first calculations for uh, primordial nucleosynthesis were made by Wagner, Fowler and Hoyle, properly starting not from neutrons, but from a mixture of protons and neutrons, and uh, producing uh, the in particular, the fragile element, not only a lot of helium-4 that you see there, one quarter of the material. This is clearly clear to understand because uh, at freeze out, the ratio of neutrons to protons is uh, 13%. And since all the neutrons are captured to make the most stable nucleus in that uh, region of the table, helium-4, so you have 13 plus 13%, 26% in the form of helium-4. And not only that, but it is the only way we have to produce deuterium in the universe. Deuterium was also the most fragile of the isotopes. It's only destroyed inside stars at temperatures of less than a million degrees. And the only way that it can be produced in the Big Bang is that there you have a lot of protons and neutrons. There is no other place in the universe uh, that you can have so many protons and neutrons together. And this is why deuterium is produced. And the fact that the temperature in the universe diminish, uh, is reduced very rapidly there makes it uh, that some of this deuterium is saved. It's not destroyed anymore. If there was a much slower uh, decline of the temperature, then deuterium should also be destroyed. So these, all these things and many others that have been explored over the years show that the primordial nucleosynthesis is in very good agreement, in excellent agreement with observations, although there remains some problem with the lithium-7 uh, up to now. But let's go back to stars. We all know now that a massive star at the end of its life makes a, a core of iron, which collapses since there is no nuclear fuel to, to burn anymore. And then somehow an explosion takes place. And uh, all this, uh, by the way, this, uh, what I just showed you, and you see also there, this famous onion skin model of the advanced uh, evolution of the massive star was uh, for the first time drawn by Hoyle in, 19, uh, in the 50s in one of his popularization books with the title Astronomy. These day, nowadays, this uh, figure is much more elaborated than in Hoyle, but it is Hoyle who uh, invented this presentation, this kind of diagram for the structure of the massive star at the end of its life. In 1953, we have detected the Crab Nebula, and we knew that it was the explosion of the star, because that explosion in this place in the sky was already mentioned by Chinese astronomers. Uh, about a uh, uh, thousand years ago. So it was clear that this that it was a stellar explosion and uh, the abundances showed that there were elements uh, that were um, ejected by the explosion. So we knew that stars uh, eject elements in their explosion. But what kind of elements they make and what powers their light cars? It was already known in this day and now we shall enter not uh, the, the chapter, not of stable nuclear, quiescent nucleosynthesis, but of explosive nucleosynthesis. It was known that supernova have uh, exponentially decaying light curves. And what means exponen exponential is usually associated to radioactive decay. Some, some radioactive nucleus was uh, powering the light curves of supernova, but what nucleus? Borst had suggested beryllium-7, must be a nucleus with a lifetime around two months. Uh, 
and Bad and colleagues have suggested Californium 254, which also has a lifetime of uh, about two months. Californium 254, nobody knows about it now, but in those days it was very popular because it had been found in uh, the ashes of the thermonuclear explosion in Bikini Island. And people thought that if uh, an explosion of 1952, and this was taken as evidence because it's a very rich uh, neutron rich nucleus. And uh, since in the bomb, the bomb was triggered by a uranium uh, bomb. So neutrons were captured on uranium nuclei to go up to, to 254. And people thought that the rapid process produced a lot of Californium 254. And it was necessarily this Californium that powered the curves of supernova. In a famous paper of Hoyer and Fowler in 1960, uh, where a very lengthy paper where they explored all aspects of explosive nucleosynthesis, they said that, uh, as Bad said, that it's Californium. This, this uh, figure is also from B square FH, that Californium powers the light curves of supernova by analogy with nuclear reactions. But this was not the case. And the guy who found what happens is not an astronomer, not a nuclear physicist, but a chemist who published that in a very obscure review of uh, Ohio State University in uh, 1963, suggesting that nickel 56, which has a lifetime of just one week, is produced in those explosions. It decays in cobalt 56, which has a lifetime of two months. And the last one, is, is uh, decays finally to the stable iron 56. In other terms, he suggested that the iron 56, which is the most stable nucleus in nature, is produced as unstable nickel 56. And according to Hoyle, this was his greatest regret. Hoyle has spent all of his time imagining all kinds of nuclear processes, producing all the nuclei in nature, and he missed although this was his first uh, work in 1946, the fact that iron 56 is not produced as such. It's really amazing. Now, what happens in actual reality is the following. Hoyle has considered nuclear statistical equilibrium, but not for a short, uh, not in an explosive event. The last stages of the evolution of a massive star take some time, several hours, and in those hours, all reactions, both strong and weak ones, have time to occur. Many electron captures in the core of the star, which is very dense. If you don't have enough time at your disposal, but an explosive, in an explosive event, then weak interactions do not have time to operate. And so you have only strong reactions, mainly by alpha uh, captures. And in that case, you go from all the way to the iron peak, but through this straight line you see there, the diagonal, in equal numbers of neutrons and protons. And the most stable nucleus there is up what you see there, the nickel 56. This is what is formed in an explosive event. In the case of a collapsing stellar core, the last stages in the lifetime of the star, you have the time for the weak interactions, electron captures, and then you increase the proportion of neutrons and you form iron 56. This is what happens in the core of the star. But this iron 56 never comes out of the star. It goes down with a gravitational collapse to make a neutron star or a black hole. It never comes out. It's only the explosive process, the subsequent explosive process, which produces nickel 56, that can uh, expel material out of the star. And this is what happened and why Hoyle missed that point. And it's amazing that some other guy found that. Now, this was uh, understood uh, by several people uh, um, when Clayton, Colgate, and Fishman uh, explored what happens in type 1a supernova. And they also suggested that this these radioactive nuclei, the gamma ray lines produced by the decay of these radioactive nuclei, could be at some point detected when 
the supernova uh, would be sufficiently thin for the gamma rays to go through the envelope because up to that time the gamma rays in the early stages of the supernova explosion are captured by the envelope and power the luminosity of the supernova okay this is uh, yeah all those things are well known now and i'm very close to the end last point remember that hoyle did not know how to eject the nuclei of the explosion to the interstellar medium and invoked rotational instability later in their paper fowler and hoyle suggested thermonuclear energy not rotational energy to uh, during the explosion of supernova to eject the elements but all this but they made extensive calculations but with no computers just by using slide rules and it's amazing how far they went in that but this was not the final answer uh, in the 60s several people that had worked in the nuclear weapons program of the united states uh, came back to the universities and uh, used all the knowledge they had from the nuclear weapons including numerical simulations to explore uh, explosive events in the universe supernova and in a fundamental paper colgate and white explored the hydrodynamic behavior of supernova explosion sterling colgate that you see there was a member of the well-known colgate family those with the toothpaste and uh, he was not very appreciated by his family because he didn't make much money still he was the best diagnostician of the united states in terms of nuclear weapons he could uh, understand by looking at just uh, exploring the ashes the traces of uh, a nuclear explosion the yield of the weapon what kind of material it was used how much fuel it was used what the mechanism was and so on and so forth and he was also very good at uh, uh, using uh, computer programs uh, an excellent physicist and numeric uh, yeah, very good with numerical calculations and so you see in the abstract of that paper that the last if you see the last paragraph the last uh, phrase the energy released corresponds to the change in gravitational potential of the unstable imploding core the transfer of energy takes place by the emission and deposition of neutrinos in contrast to Barbage, fowler and hoyle or foul uh, or the paper of hoyle and fowler which they explored they showed that the nuclear reactions do not release a lot of energy enough to expel the mantle of a massive star instead of that what happens is and you see for the first time this uh, famous diagram as a function of time we see what happened in the interior of a collapsing stellar uh, core the radius that you see in the logarithmic scale there you see that in the first place when it collapses the radii go down the, over various layers and at some point when neutrinos are being deposited then this turns out to explosion 99 percent in fact of the gravitational energy for the dynamical collapse of the iron core is released in the form of neutrinos some of them interact with the stellar mantle and expel it making a supernova it is the first time that neutrinos were mentioned in a paper about super mechanism of supernova explosions and uh, this is a very cited paper very well cited paper because it changed completely the paradigm about supernova explosion and how the elements are that are produced by the star are expelled in the interstellar medium and uh, 20 years later we had an ex incredible event in the large magellanic cloud an event that had happens once in a lifetime with an astronomer somebody said a supernova exploded for the first time seen by naked eye from the southern hemisphere in um, 150,000 light years from the earth and uh, two things two main things come out from that explosion first of all we really detected the gamma ray line of the decay of cobalt 56 as clayton colgate and fishman had predicted At some point we should see it and we saw it although six months earlier than expected because there are instabilities hydrodynamical instabilities in the supernova explosion that mix up the interior of the star with the envelope and then also extremely important uh, 
about a dozen neutrinos were detected from three different detectors. The neutrinos that Colgate and uh, White have predicted in their model of 66. And I think we could stop now. Of course, there are other things to be said about uh, our understanding of the S process or the R process, which is not yet quite understood, but it would take us much uh, further um, from our uh, schedule. So I will uh, finish with all that. So here I summarize the various processes we now know uh, populate the cosmic abundance uh, of the chemical elements. Uh, with the neutron captures. And then the equivalent we have now from this uh, sketch of Hoyle in 54. You remember in his 1954 paper, where from material coming from the Big Bang, not from the voids between galaxies, as Hoyle believed in his steady state. From this material, galaxies are formed with small and massive stars. Those stars become red giants, making uh, heavier elements in their interiors. The small stars give planetary nebula, make planetary nebula and uh, the massive star supernova. Both uh, things expel elements in interstellar medium. The small stars give be behind white dwarfs. If they are in binary systems, they may explode in type 1a supernova, making most of the iron. And the big stars give, let, leave behind neutron stars or black holes. And if those stars are in binary systems, then we may have also neutron mergers, which may produce uh, the R elements we see around us, as we think today, although it's not yet uh, crystal clear. And from this material, which is mixed in interstellar medium and which is bombarded by cosmic rays, the fragile nuclei, uh, lithium, beryllium, and boron are also formed. And new generations of stars are formed, and this is the principle of galactic chemical evolution. So today we have very good understanding of these things. You see here a chemical evolution model, uh, predictions and compared to calculations within a factor of uh, the order of two. This is logarithmic scale. We understand what happens. And this was a tremendous achievement of nuclear astrophysics in the 20th century. This is why William Fowler had the physics Nobel in 1983. And many people created for a scandal, of course, because Fred Hoyle was even more involved in that and he really deserved it. Hoyle has his statue in Cambridge University now. He's the only astronomer, recent astronomer I know that he has a statue for himself and rightly so. And uh, here is, uh, we started with uh, in the beginning saying that nuclear astrophysics uh, my, had uh, as a target to explore the origin of stellar energy, the origin of the elements. Both things were achieved within 50 years. And uh, in doing that, during that exploration, a lot, a lot of disciplines were involved and many new disciplines were created. Uh, I leave you see all these things here. There are hundreds of people working in those things. Uh, today, a lot of our colleagues, over uh, dozens of laboratories in the whole world. And uh, you see that from such simple questions, why do the sun shine? Where do the elements come from? A whole field of physics may emerge, which is still continuing. And uh, last thing, uh, this is the table of the periodic elements with uh, the origin of those elements. And you see here that a large part of our uh, body, which is mainly produced, uh, composed of water, uh, most of the water is oxygen, but uh, one eight, ninth part of that is hydrogen. And so a few kilos in each one of us are coming uh, directly from the primordial universe. It's 14 billion years old. And so I think we should uh, stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.